Hello, everyone. Um, good evening from a uh, very sunny uh, Sheffield. It's lovely to have you all uh, here. My name is Joe. I'm from the social enterprise Opus Independence that runs the Festival of Debate. Uh, the festival programme runs from the 13th of April to the 26th of May and includes over 70 events, 150 speakers and 50 partners. The festival looks to explore the entangled ecological, economic and political crises we collectively face. There are no easy answers, but we hope the festival creates a space to explore and hold that complexity and uncertainty and brings together a community of people to make change where they are. Most of our events are free at the point of access. Where we need to charge, we try and keep ticket prices as low as possible. If you'd like to make a donation to the Festival of Debate, you can do so by visiting our website, festivalofdebate.com. Um, before we begin, I'm just going to run through a couple of uh, housekeeping things. We're using a Zoom webinar uh, for tonight's event. I uh, could encourage you to, to leave reflections in, in the chat box, which you can access at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we also have a Q&A box uh, this evening for the Q&A um, section, which will happen a little bit later on in, in tonight's event. So you can post any questions in the Q&A box and audience members can also upvote questions. So uh, the questions with the most upvotes uh, will be answered first. And to upvote, you can just click on the Q&A box when a question is in there and just click a, a thumbs up um, next to uh, the question that you like the most. And that one will be answered uh, first. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased and, and excited tonight's event as part of a series of events we're running um, with a great organisation called Dark Matter Labs and now I'd like to invite our host uh, Jonathan who's from Dark Matter Labs to uh, take over and run the proceedings. Thank you Jonathan. Hey Joe, uh, thank you so much uh, and thank you to Opus in general for creating the space uh, for us today. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, this is the second of a series of five events that we're organizing on similar topics uh, with Opus. Um, and it's part, the focus is really about reimagining our relationship with the land, rivers, homes, each other, um, and looking at going beyond frameworks of dispossession, domination, and exploitation to relationships that are more about mutuality, reciprocity, and regener regeneration. Um, so we'll go through, I'll first set the stage um, after having in, uh, shortly introduced uh, our uh, panelists, and then we'll have some more in-depth presentations, some questions between us, and then we'll open up uh, the conversation with all of us, all of you uh, present. And so to start, I would like to uh, welcome in Neve, Calvin, and Fang to join me. Uh, yeah, my name is Jean Latin. So I've been working at Dark Matter Labs for more than four years. Um, and I'm joining from uh, Montreal, Montreal, Jojage, Quebec, Canada. Uh, and so please, Calvin, Fang, and Neve, if you could just say, you know, uh, your name organization that you're based in, um, and also what interested you in that topic explicitly in the first place. So for me, for instance, it was noticing how much vacant spaces existed in cities and how much people needed those space, but for some reason didn't have access to it and the contradiction of the supply and demand on, on, on the site of cities uh, that got me interested in that. Um, so I'll start with you, Fang. Hi, everyone. My name is Fang. I'm the Responsible Innovation Lead at Dark Matter Labs. I'm very interested in reinvigorate our relationship with Earth beyond red light boundaries. So I'm personally coming from the perspective of land reform and land governance and looking at how we can balance our rights and responsibilities. I'm going to hand over to Calvin. Hi, my name is Calvin. I'm also from Dark Matter Labs. Uh, my background was in architecture and urban design, but now I work as a strategic designer and researcher at Dark Matter Labs. And I guess what got me interested in issues around land and property and the kind of institutional infrastructures around them was first encountering the planning system as an architectural designer. And it's been a deep, deep rabbit hole uh, since then. Um, <laughs> I'll probably, yeah, 
Uh, I'll, I'll hand over to Neve now. Hi. I'm Neve. I work at Dark, oh, sorry, I work at Open Systems Lab as a researcher, and my background is architecture. And I got into this niche of land ownership. I think because of as an architect, you want to create beautiful places, and then you work in the real world, and you realize how many barriers there are there to you doing that. And then another thing was the realization that. Um, we can solve the housing crisis tomorrow by redesigning these ownership contracts and we don't need politicians to do it. So once I realized that through reading Alistair Parvin's work, I had to find a way to start working on this. Thank you so much, you three. Um, and I would invite everyone, please, if you could share uh, where you're based uh, in the chat. Um, and also if you're aware of the legal systems that apply in terms of property regime where you're based. Uh, in the chat so we have an understanding and uh, a preview of who's joining and all the legal systems that are represented uh, in the room and to start with um i'd like to invite us to really acknowledge each of us where we are so for instance i'm in my apartment um that i own recently i have some responsibilities to pay my mortgage to the bank i have some responsibilities to the condo associations to my neighbor to not have a subwoofer in my apartment because that would be kind of rude. Um, I have also some rules that the municipalities have in terms of their bylaws. Uh, for instance, we don't have very biodiversity friendly bylaws in Quebec that it's more reinforcing lawns rather than full biodiversity and our responsibilities to other species and to insects and to plants and to other benefits that we could provide. Um, in Canada, it's kind of a mix between civil law in Quebec, common law and the rest, indigenous legal orders that have been suppressed or that are resurging in many cases. And if you look at the bundle of rights that civil right, civil um, that sorry, that civil law has, it's really focusing on rights, right? The right to abuse, the right to take advantage of. Uh, and so when we look at some of the problematic relationships we have with the earth, uh, it is inscribed in our relationships and rights and less so in some of the responsibilities that are recognized in property regimes. Um, one thing that Satsan, uh, an indigenous elder from the Cent Center for First Nation Governance uh, told me many years ago that made me realize a little bit how different some legal systems were was how in civil law and common law we focus more on a bundle of rights uh, rather than a bundle of responsibilities um, and that has tons of implications in how we relate to each other to the spaces around us uh, and to what is possible and needed to transform uh, as we move forward um, and each and for instance you don't see it from here but there's a a new building that was built next to mine at the beginning of the pandemic, and it's been vacant ever since. And we're talking about a lot of square footage uh, for years sitting vacant. And one could question, why is it okay to have the right to exclude everyone from that property that is not being used for any social function or ecological function for all these years? And what is the next generation of theories and mechanisms and uh, infrastructures around that that we could build to address this. Um, and also, how do we perceive land in all of this? Often we see it as kind of the backdrop on which we live our lives in a kind of like absent, passive, deficitalized entity rather than an active agent in all our lives. And so this is just maybe an invitation throughout this conversation, throughout the presentations to reflect on how it affects each of us personally, all these layers uh, and how it affects how we think, how we perceive the world. Um, it's also a way to, uh, no, switching now to something else. Uh, just wanna mention, you know, this is us working out loud, okay? we have. The more we work on this, the more questions we have, actually. Uh, it's kind of growing even faster than some of the answers that we're finding. Uh, so 
it's really also an invitation for you to contribute. We really want to hear from you, uh, hear feedback, questions, uh, and uh, working out loud is really important for us. Uh, so this is a really great opportunity to do so. Um, so before we dive deeper uh, with Calvin and Neve, uh, I'd like to invite Fang to summarize briefly some of the main insights that she had from the last, the first conversation in this series that was organized called Verbs, Not Nouns. Uh, so Fang? Hi, yes, I'm happy to share the, verb, uh, the key takeaways from verbs, not nouns, the role of language in scaffolding alternative worldviews and futures. So the, the talk by Giyu, the linguist from the Powerless Nation, and Yu Jie, the, art, the other linguist doing a PhD in Hawaii, they really broaden my horizon and imagination around balanced rights and responsibilities and how stewardship and reciprocity can be exercised. So starting from language, but really going into the knowledge systems and worldview and how we can relate to uh, land, rivers, houses, and everything. So language is a way to see and coexist in a world. Indigenous languages like the Powerless language that we heard from the previous webinar um, and many others uh, practice the grammar of animacy through stories, agreements, and their own bodies and actions verb-based language speak of relations and acting together in embodied and visceral ways. So for example, uh, Giyu mentioned about there was a name of a place where you um, can actually see a lot of bees and that place is somewhat dangerous for humans. And you that is a very visceral, um, it's a, it's a verb-based um, ways of relating with nature that tells you how you um, interact with them in, in the context of um, respect and a relationship. So inversely, a non-based language like English generates categori uh, categorizations and classifications. And this tends to ob objectify reality in uh, induced dualism and freeze what's possible. So all these inert nouns creates a scaffolding for an overcomplication that erases life. So what does it mean then to train ourselves to think of everything as a verb? So for example, during Giyu's talk, he spoke about hunter, the role of hunter and the action of hunting. In English, it has very um, negative connotations connotation related to like the resources extraction. But from Taiwanese perspective, they embrace holistic knowledge. Their rights to full security hugely rely on the, resp the responsibilities to maintain water systems, knowing where to set the traps so they don't catch young animals, knowing when and where to hunt so they don't interrupt the breeding seasons. And this made me think of in the current governance systems, like we have zonings, you know, this is a commercial area, this is a residential area. The way we govern our land systems is hugely, um, is very static. Whereas if we look at the Pawanese um, ways of governing the land, is the, the way they govern it is in a constant flux. The hunting area, is not being zoned in a static way. It's relating to the cosmology, the geography, how they relate to the land and the animal habitat and, and so on. So it makes me think, can we do zoning in a way that recognize all relations with everything that's not static? So this is a really practical pathway that allows for people like me thinking about land governance and more like governance in general how we can look at redesigning the, the bureaucracy. How do we think about the, you know, the, the, it's, it's part of the boring revolution that Doug Mental Labs talks a lot about. How do we do this? And there are other examples like borrowing from rivers that talks about new ways of looking at the, the, the economy, the secure economy. So there's actually quite a lot of tangible pathways for us to learn from and build upon. Just one quick um, note uh, before I hand over to uh, Calvin, because 
some uh, audiences spoke about the worry of cultural appropriation. And so I also want to bring this point around indigeneity. So for um, indig indigeneity is both an action that we take and the relationship that we have with nature. And this connection is open to anyone, regardless of identity or origin. So if we feel a connection with the land and have a desire to protect it, then we are, we are practicing a form of indigeneity. So if we can continue to listen carefully, understand the context, take it to heart and attempt to put it into practice with care, I think we don't need to worry too much around um, uh, cultural appropriation, we are all becoming native to a place. So I'm going to uh, end my reflection here and hand it over to Calvin to talk about um, the conceptual framework around properties. Over to you, Calvin. Uh, thank you, Fang. And can everyone see my screen? I think yes. it's working. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, so my name is Calvin. I'm from Dark Matter Labs. And uh, I'm going to be doing a bit of scene setting about why we're focusing on this particular topic today, about how we can reimagine our relationship with land from property to propertize. Uh, and to answer Jonathan's kind of uh, provocation, um, I'm actually speaking from London in England. And there's a saying here where an Englishman's home is his castle. And we also often talk about the idea of the property owning democracy. And the idea of property and its ownership is deeply ingrained in our culture and it's almost sacred. And property rights, especially things to do with real property like land and buildings, is often described as the foundations of a liberal society. And even though they've been imposed through sometimes illiberal, colonial and violent ways. Um, but it's becoming increasingly clear that property rights um, the property rights that underpin are underpinning many of the planetary challenges that we face. For example, they legitimize private value extraction while commoning its consequences. For example, how we allow the extraction of fossil fuels for private profit while unleashing global consequences. Um, it also underpins the vicious cycle of inequalities that arise from ownership as a monopoly of scarce resources. This is perhaps best exemplified by the fact that we still have empty homes during a housing crisis. Um, all of these things are perhaps symptomatic of the fact that our current system of property is actually failing to balance the freedoms of rights with the burdens of responsibilities, especially when those consequences are falling on non-individual and non-human kind of things, such as the social and ecological commons. And we would argue, in fact, that these so-called externalities are in fact deeply intrinsic. Um, but rather than focusing on what's only wrong with individual behaviors as a system or trying to fix these imbalances, we have to ask ourselves, is there actually something more fundamentally wrong with the system itself? And given the scale of the climate crisis, we find ourselves asking property, ownership, its hierarchies of control, are these the right frameworks for the planetary transition that we need? Um, and we're certainly not the first people to reflect on the property system. Uh, I want to share a quote by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who said, um, the first man who having enclosed a piece of ground thought himself saying, this is mine and found people simple enough to believe him was the real founder of civil society. And I, I like this quote because it kind of highlights the arbitrariness of this institution of property as we currently understand it. And actually it's not just about having the simple people who to believe in the system, but also it's often enforced through the power of violent force to enforce these claims. Um, but property as a way of relating to the world around us is far from an inevitable conclusion. And I want to set, share this quote from uh, Robin Wall Klimmer's book, um, Braiding Sweetgrass. And she is a writer from the Potawatomi heritage. And she said, um, in the settler mind, land was property, real estate, capital, or natural resources. But to our people, it was everything. Identity, the connection to our ancestors, the home of our non-human kinfolk, our pharmacy, our library, the source of all that sustained us. Our lands where, we, where, where our responsibility to the world was enacted, sacred ground. It belonged to itself. It was a gift, not a commodity. So it could never be bought or sold. And land and property is not just a passive repository of resource and economic value. 
Land is also a source of cultural and social value from a sense of belonging to and group identity to even a sense of spiritual and ecological rootedness. And the prism of property as it currently stands, stamps out these modes of relating. Um, and this picture you can see now is actually a group of Noir people, Aboriginal Noir people, painting a map of geographically and spiritually important sites of their area uh, done in their uh, indigenous style. And this is actually used as evidence to help the Noir people win back the title to the land. So how can we rethink our relationship with the earth beyond property? Um, and the questions we want to ask are, instead of humans being the subjects and the earth being the object and commodities, can we recognize everything as its own proper self, from flora to fauna to habitats to water systems to minerals and even the land? And instead of only ownership and dominion, can we reimagine our ties with the land and the earth as part of a network of relationship built on care, mutuality, and reciprocity with a community of both humans and non-humans in a way that recognizes the agency of everything? These are the questions that we are asking ourselves uh, in our work we're calling from property to proper ties. So what are the implications of some of these questions? For example, how can we explore and broaden the very spectrum of the nature of things around us? And how do we define these things? How might a tree as a thing be different from the atmosphere as a thing or the water system as a thing? And how might, would this shape the relationship that we can have with these things? And in converse, how could our civic infrastructures, governance tools and institutions might also be different if we recognize the earth as consisting of a complex system of agents who are unownable, unownable so that they can't be taken, invaded, exploited, extracted or dominated. And finally, how do these systems, tools and institutions fit within a longer historical trajectory and future trajectory of our evolving relationship with land? What are the stepping stones that we could take towards a fully relational future? And on this note, I'd like to end with touching on some of the live projects that we hope uh, that we are working on in this space and that are try and prove that this relational future is possible and could potentially be some stepping stones. Uh, for example, I think there's someone in the audience from Scotland. Uh, we're actually working with the Scottish Land Commission and we're looking at existing tools within the Scottish land system that can be reimagined and hacked to transition us towards this more deeply relational future, such as crofting and, the, and common grazing. Perhaps we can touch a bit on it in the Q&A later. Um, there's also the idea of free house, which is Dark Matter Lab's proposal for a house that owns itself. So if the house owns itself, how might it change our relationship with a home beyond ownership and tenancy? And finally, um, we're, we're also working on the River Dawn project with Opus, who are the hosts on this festival. And there are actually a couple of events coming up as part of this festival program uh, about this specific project with a number of partners happening on the 22nd of April and the 30th of May and the Kellam Island Industrial Museum. And the questions we want to ask ourselves in this project is, how can we get the River Dawn recognized with legal personhood? And how will legal personhood change the way we have relationships with the river, both socially, environmentally, politically, and economically? So I hope that's a lot of food for thought for everyone. And I want to hand back to Jonathan, who will be uh, introducing Neve as our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Calvin. Uh, thank you, Fang, also for your summary of uh, the last um, session. And if I might say a word also, uh, Calvin, on micro treaties with the earth. If you search online property rights, property wrongs, micro treaties with the earth, it's one uh, proof of possibility we've been exploring here. And what's interesting is that sometimes, at least culturally, we think that, you know, property rights are almost absolute in some context. But when you start looking into more details, you know, here, for instance, we're on unceded territory of uh, Indigenous people. And the in the Constitution in Canada, Section 35 reaffirms and recognizes indigenous legal orders at a higher level than pro property rights are recognized at the provincial level. So how these different layers might influence property right titles is still a question that is up for grab in this context and in all the other contexts that we're exploring. Um, so moving on now to Neve, uh, who I'm really excited to see. Uh, and hear about the new tool you're developing that I had the chance to have a little preview of. Uh, so the screen is yours. 
Thanks, Jonathan. Um, yeah, so just to reintroduce myself, I'm working with Open Systems Lab, who are based in London, but I'm currently based in Portugal, actually. And yeah, I'm currently in a short term rental contract and I have a lot of obligations, but I'm very close to the ocean, which is kind of my source of uh, ecological well-being and spirituality and all of that. So it's just so, in, yeah, this whole topic is, is really fascinating to me and deeply personal. Um, so I've been working on a project called the Atlas of Ownership for the last two years, really as a way to learn more about um, this idea of what are our legal relationships to the land and how were they designed? And how can we learn more about these relationships that we've kind of inherited and we practice so often, but we don't really question um, the origin of them. And if and they're, they're and are they even fit for purpose anymore? Um, so, okay, I will share my screen. Um, can you guys see my screen? Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. So I initially got really interested in this work because of I was working in architecture and the housing crisis was is it was just very troubling to me, and I felt just that the the skills we had as architects were completely inefficient to address this crisis and. In common discourse today, when, or even when we're, we're talking amongst ourselves about the house, housing crisis, we're wondering, OK, is it the, the, the dysfunction of the left or the right or who's to blame? Is it a function of human greed? And, you know, I think it's really interesting, like these old left or right ideologies, they're not really able to answer or really address the question. We really need to go. Be, we need to go beyond that, really. And the idea of human greed as well, it can't be ignored because greed is, is a part of being human. Like we, we can all get a bit greedy. So when we're talking about the housing crisis and our relationships to the places that we live that are supported by the law, our legal systems, our land systems, we're talking about how we regulate human, human behavior in, in the world, in the built environment. And we really want to be aiming towards systems that are based on fairness and that can regulate greed and that incentivize really beautiful behavior and stewardship and reciprocity and yeah so we it's really about learning about how do we create these new these new social contracts so um land ownership is a form of power and it always has been and the fact is that today um the property system or global real estate is the single largest form of wealth in the world is the biggest player in town. And we all, I think, you know, it's kind of shocking to see this diagram because you can, in, in, in the media, we're hearing about, you know, the profits that oil companies are making or tech companies are making. But when you look at this diagram, it shows that global real estate is really the, the biggest form of wealth. And I think in our communities, we're all feeling the, the pinch of the rents we have to pay, the mortgages we have to pay, the high land prices. And we're not seeing this huge form of wealth being reinvested into our communities for ecologically supportive infrastructure and community facilities. So what's really fascinating to me is how do we learn more about this system and start to re-channel this huge form of wealth back, back into our communities? Um, and I think one of the reasons it's difficult for us to understand how the system works is because it operates on this kind of multi-layered multi -layered institution. So we have a planning system that controls development. We have our financial system, you know, that makes it possible for us to even obtain land through mortgages and lending. We have national legislation. It's another layer of law and regulation. Then we have contract law, which defines, you know, our rights to private property is very, very malleable and creative, actually. Um, and then we have case law as well, which kind of deals with, with um, more specific, uh, uh, kind of specific, uh, what's the word? Um, unique cases of, of, of uh, I can't remember, anyway. So yeah, so basically our land system is reliant on all these different layers of, institution and legal kind of mechanisms and control so when we're talking about land ownership and redesigning ownership for for the common good we kind of need to be have some awareness of all of these different these different institutions and mechanisms um 
And yeah, so we don't really have a language to talk about land ownership in a way that's really helpful and is creative. And the legal language, I think, is a big part of this. The way legislation is written, the way policy is written, the way um, contract law is written, you either need to have a lot, a lot of time on your hands or have a law degree or be an expert or a certain an expert in the fields to even understand um, the legal code, which, you know, is the information about how this hugely powerful system actually works. We don't have a language to talk about it. And the Atlas of Ownership is, is really a way to try and change that. And in common, in common discourse as well, when we're, we're talking about housing crises or trying to solve the housing crises, the focus is on a very, very narrow number of, of ways of owning land. So we focus on socially, social renting, private renting, and then private property. And that's it. We, we don't talk about community owned land. Um, which is, it's kind of crazy to me why we're not really looking at, you know, these really amazing solutions. It's this focus on a very, very narrow number of tenure models. And renting and private property um, are both, when we look at them in detail and the origin of them, they're both designed to be dysfunctional power relationships, um, one to oppress the other. They weren't really ever designed at their core, you know, to be models of home ownership for the masses. Um, Private property was designed as a way for the for colonization, the colonial idea to kind of extract wealth and channel wealth from communities to individuals. And then social re renting was really designed as a way for landowners to oppress commoners. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's just so interesting to understand the origins of these models and to really look about how we can really redesign them for the purposes that we, we want homes and, and land and places to work for, yeah, we need to re re redesign these very core contracts, these social agreements. So um, I suppose I started this project because this, the realization through the work of Alistair Parvin that we can solve the housing crisis tomorrow by redesigning our social agreements of home ownership. We can redesign home ownership with fair, um, terms and conditions with fair rights and responsibilities. We can give people the right to put down roots, but not be able to financially turn that, that home into a financial asset by profiting from other people's labor. You know, we can we can redesign home ownership to have fair rent that is reinvested into the community. We can put stewardship obligations that the home is built with natural materials that won't harm the environment. It's so we can we can redesign these contracts without politicians, just through legal, legal tenure and this idea we can be so creative with the law and there's so many amazing examples all over the world and throughout history of of communities and societies managing and sharing land in really really um fair ways that steward the environment and the knowledge is already out there we just need to access it so i basically started researching alternative ways of owning land and I kind of looked at innovative kind of new models so looking at coin street and what's really interesting about coin street in London is it's a co-housing community um and they use a kind of a social renting model but to become eligible to be a resident at coin street stewardship is kind of a big part of the allocations process so a big part of being a resident at coin street is being a steward of that place and in an urban, dense environment, stewardship of that place is kind of maintaining um, the shared landscapes. And sometimes that can also mean, you know, if there's homeless people around, that you're guiding them to social services. So being a steward at Coin Street is very specific to its place. So the ideas of stewardship are very context specific. And I think they should be really redesigned with the users um, um, at the core, it should be the people who are using these places and looking after these places that they're going to understand really what stewardship really means to them. They belong to that place. They're looking after that place. They have they have rights to that place, but they also have responsibilities to that place. Um, you know, they're not just shifting their responsibilities to the state. Then I looked at tribal land tenure in Ireland. So Ireland had its own native legal system um, that was abolished um, during colonization. And of course, the tool of colonization was, was the redesign of land ownership. 
So there was a high, we had a in Ireland, we had a highly sophisticated system of, of owning and sharing land that was very much egalitarian. It was hierarchy, so she, there was, there was social hierarchies, but it was very much egalitarian. So there's so many amazing ideas of, uh, you know, looking after each other, ecological well-being, social well-being, social responsibility that are embed, that are deeply embedded into the laws around the land, and it's fascinating. Um, yeah, to look at society through the lens of land ownership, you can really learn a lot about how that society actually works. Um, and then chattel houses, I looked at. So these these are kind of like the original tiny house. So. Uh, under British rule, again, in, in Barbados, the 19th and 20th century, 20th century after slavery was abolished, um, the way the plantation owners retained control over the former slaves was by turning them from slaves into tenants who had to pay a rent. And of course, all their, their wages had to go on rent. So that's how they controlled them. And they, they said had access to their labor. So as a way for tenants to escape oppressive landlords, they built these movable tiny houses and it meant they didn't have to pay as much rent. And um, yeah, they could escape as oppressive landlords. And it's very interesting to kind of look at the tiny house movement today. And um, yeah, a very similar movement that existed um, not long after, after slavery. So we can start to see the links between human slavery and being a tenant who pays rent and the origins of, of these models. I could talk about some of these case studies all day, but I really don't have time. So I'm gonna just flick through them. Um, but yeah, all of these case studies are being researched and unbundled on the Atlas of Ownership. And um, this is, yeah, this is an amazing project in Ireland, actually. It's about create, it's about reestablishing native forests in Ireland, but um, the charity who, who created it, they're working with existing landowners and farmers so they're 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 re-establishing native forests on on farms which is also introducing the ideas of agroforestry to farms so it's just really beautiful ideas of stewardships and, and new land agreements and um, but working with working with the the real the real local context so there's there's just so many beautiful inspir inspirational stories out there and we're just trying to gather them all and and so we can all learn more about them and then this is the, the original community land trust in the 1960s in America that emerged during the civil rights movement. Um, so we can start to see as well the connections with movements like Black Lives Matter and, and access to land. This is a kind of an interesting story I thought I would talk about. So in the West Coast of Ireland, Donald Trump, um, de he's, he's developed a hotel and golf resort and it's on the coast of the West of Ireland and there's in a really, really beautiful beach that's very popular with surfers it's very off the beaten track there's not much there's not really any infrastructure there and by the development of Donald Trump's golf course he blocked the entrance uh to the beach for the surfers and there was kind of a little bit of local uh uproar about this and the surfers the local surfers and their industry had to kind of come up with like a new social agreement that they could access the beach through walking across the golf course and it's just really I used to live down there and I used to go surfing at this beach and it's just a very interesting very peculiar experience of you're going for a surf and you park in this kind of weird little par car park that's not really part of the official hotel and then you have to navigate your way to the beach through this super manicured golf course and it just feels like a very interesting ju juxtaposition of of yeah, different types of social social groups coming together and finding a way to to manage and share um, the land together. <laughs> it's just really interesting, and of course, you know, it's I think it's really interesting as well because it's it's like yeah, you can play golf, you can and you can surf, and we can manage and share this place together. We can find ways around um, sharing these these resources together in a way that makes sense for everyone. It doesn't have to be only surfers are only golfers. It, we can all come up with more sophisticated ways to, to live together and to accept everything. So ownership of land, I find very interesting to compare to the idea of a marriage um, because it's a social contract and it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It, hap there's a pub there's, it happens in the public arena because it's supported by certain institutions and um, it's a kind of a, an agreement that requires both rights and responsibilities if it's done in a healthy way. Like a, 
a, a dysfunctional marriage will be one person kind of having dominion over the other but a healthy marriage will be you know you have responsibilities to that person and you also have, you know you have rights freedoms and responsibilities but that they're in a kind of balance so i find ownership of land and, and property yeah I, I find it useful to think about it in terms of similar to a marriage it's like this social this social contract this social agreement um, and through unbundling and researching many different ways of owning land and property, um, we kind of started to, to deconstruct each, each, um, each model into a series of patterns that was easily describable in plain English. And to organize all this information, we created a framework um, so, any, any, so, so that we can describe any any model of land ownership um, through this easy language. So each right or responsibility to land that is designed, it will fall into one of these categories. So we have eligibility. How does somebody become eligible for this piece of land? Um, is it because they have 40 grand in the bank and they can they can get a deposit together? Or you know, maybe they're they were inherited land, so it's part of being from um, a particular family. And that makes them eligible. Um, so yeah, how do we design eligibility? How do we allocate these resources? You, do you have to be part of a particular tribe? Do you have to be from a particular place? Then we have security of tenure. So security of tenure is the right to put down roots. And it's the right, and maybe does somebody else have the right to evict you? Is there a supreme authority that can evict you? Um, and then things like compulsory purchase order. Can the queen or the government just decide to 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 take ownership of your property and, and you have to go somewhere else you might get you might get paid for that but who has the rights to evict you from your place or uproot you and do you have rights to put down roots indefinitely can you stay there for as long as you want then we have rights of access which is quite self-explanatory um use so the category of use is how is a how is a piece of land or property um defined in its use and um then we have develop which is kind of Use and develop are both kind of connected with the planning system. So how, what are the rights and obligations around developing land and building? Do you have the right to build a house? And are there kind of codes or design codes on maybe the, the size of the house or what materials are used? Or do you have the right to develop infrastructure? Or do you have an obligation to develop a house or infrastructure? And these ideas are quite universal. And even thousands of years ago in Ireland's native legal system, we had regulations around uh, developing houses, which are similar like to the planning, planning systems today. So these ideas are quite universal around the rights to build and but regulating the type of development. And then we have stewardship, um, which we don't see in our 10 year models, but we, it's, it's not completely absent in our land system. So stewardship is all around taking care of the place of that you live, maintaining the place. It could be maintaining ecosystems or maintain, maintaining buildings. Um, and if you're if you're extracting or or performing agriculture, that you're kind of replenishing. So it's this idea of res, reciprocity and taking care of the places that you live, maintaining environments. Transfer and rent are really important categories if you're interested in moving away from land as a financial asset. Um, so transfer is 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 all about the rules and regulations around how a piece of land or property is is passed from one entity or one person or one organization to another. Is it through buying? Two minutes left, Neve. Two minutes. Oh, okay. So and then renting. How much rent do you have to pay? Who do you pay it to? How is it calculated? Do you have the right to collect rent? Okay. Okay. I've I've really kind of ranted on too long. But I'll give you guys a quick um, look at the atlas. So we decided there was so many interesting, there's so many interesting models around ownership that, and I didn't, I just did not have time to start researching them all. And we, and so we created, we had this idea. What if we had an open digital library that we can all learn about land ownership and share models? Um, so this is what the Atlas of Ownership is. It's an open digital library that belongs to everybody. And it's about collecting interesting ways of owning land from all around the world. And at the moment, there's around 20 case studies. And um, I'll just give you guys a quick preview. So this is a model in Botswana. So this is all about how um, basically Botswana are, have they have, this is the richest diamond mine in the world. 
and Botswana basically were a foreign enterprise wanted to mine to take mine to do mining here but the government found this really interesting way to take the profits that were made from mining and and reinvest them into the the public infrastructure fund so it's a really interesting way that private enterprise and private enterprise and you know public funds can actually work together in a sophisticated way and this is informed this I, this whole model was informed by tribally owned land tenures that weren't um, eradicated during colonialism so um we can see here on the a set of rights and ob obligations um thanks joe and basically this each each case study on the atlas is unbundled in with our framework into a set of land uh, rights and obligations so you can start to learn about the patterns. So the mining company have a long lease, um, but then they also have some strict obligations. They must share, pay a share of profit back to the Botswana government. The, they must reinvest the rents they're paying to mine. Um, and those rents must be shared with the community. So the Botswana channels those mining land rents back into the investment for the long-term benefit of the, of the nation. So into health infrastructure, education infrastructure. So this is just a preview of how the Atlas of Ownership works. And um, yeah, really we, we invite people to come and, and contribute to the Atlas. And even if you just have a, a boring rental contract, anybody can, can submit um, to, to the Atlas. Okay. Thank you so much, Neve. Uh, great tool, lots of hours of exploration uh, in front of us on it. Um, I would invite Calvin and Fang uh, to join us, please. Um, there's there's so much to cover here, right? Uh, you know, we're talking about land and not necessarily all the other models of ownership that exist, whether it's about intellectual property, like the implications of AI recently, you know, data ownership and so on that are sometimes extrapolated from those models also. Um, one thing I find encouraging is that we're having this conversation. Uh, recently, a few of us were having uh, we just got back yesterday from the U.S. where we had conversations about this, and it seems like a lot of organizations and people are more open than ever to question this. Uh, and I think there's a realization that there's something profoundly problematic about some of our relationships uh, on that level. And one thing, you know, Niv, you gave that great metaphor of the, the marriage, and we we might wonder who's in that marriage exactly and what is the place of living beings in that marriage because uh, sometimes a lot of models are a marriage between people but not a marriage that includes other living beings or the ecosystem or accountability or stewardship as you said Neve, to the place and everything and what happens then is that you know if you have models that are really focused on a lot of responsibilities towards people with urban sprawl, then the local biodiversity will be completely gone in a few years in that region if we don't include in that marriage uh, other living beings. And so from everything you've looked into, Fine, Calvin, Neve, um, what is the place for responsibilities to other living beings in those proper, property models? Well, I think, this is so specific to place, but I think the idea of the wedding is so beautiful. And there's an ancient myth from Ireland. It's called the sacred wedding. And it's basically this story, and it's in the Atlas of Ownership, so anyone can look it up if they want. It's it's about the idea that ecology, social well-being, governance, power are actually all one thing. They're not separate. They're all one thing. In our society today, they are seen as separate. And in ancient Ireland, when a king was going to be elected, how that was publicly enacted was through the sacred wedding. And he was getting married to the goddess of the land. And the goddess of the land, she, she represented the, the fertility of the land and the social well-being of the place. So the enactment of the, the king being elected was him making commitment to the ecology, to the social well-being of the people. And if if you know, so it's just such a beautiful story and it just, it wraps it all together. And 
if his if his if his rule was unjust and the fertility of the land or as you say are the urban sprawling you know created an imbalance he would lose his role as king he broke the contract and there were consequences you know so i just think these indigenous old stories are so powerful and it just gets right to the root it's like you know these things are not all separate they're not economics ecology social well-being governance they're not separate they're all one thing but our systems today do not they're not sophisticated enough to recognize these and we're starting to get there but it's so fragmented so we re- what i love about the relationships to the land it brings it all together and through contracts we can just redesign them and bring it all into one agreement specific to that place exactly neve and uh you know it seems like spiritually there's many traditions that try to account for all these relations. And then in terms of our bureaucracies, analog bureaucracies in many ways, it seems like it cannot account for the full nuance and complexity of these relationships. But with a lot of innovations and transformations recently, we wonder how we can you know, bring together the high tech, T-E-K, traditional ecological knowledge with the high tech that we know of today into maybe allowing new possibilities. Um, Calvin and Fang, I'd love to hear your thoughts on on this too. Yeah, I can jump in also reflecting back on the last session with Giyu, the indigenous um, linguist from Taiwanese nation. Um, they had um, agreement between themselves and the river. So because Jonathan, you, you were reflecting back, like, do we have other agreements that actually you know, talk about the relationality beyond human and like registered companies. And I find that really inspiring. Um, so they would go to the river and ask the river permission to borrow the slates for them to build their own home. And they will make a promise to the river and say, if I move away to somewhere else, then I'll return the slate back to the river. And it makes me think like we can actually, Neve spoke about like we actually are able to redesign the contracts. So it makes me think if we can redesign the material lease agreement between ourselves and other stakeholders and entities, for example, if we want to build a house, we must resource materials like steel or timber and other resources. What if we can design that material lease agreement between for example, the house builder and also where the materials comes from. So say a forest trust, um, then you will be responsible um, of, for example, ensuring the, re, um, the reuse or recycle of the material. So you don't like the house builder and the homeowner doesn't actually own these materials. So they have a specific responsibility ties to those materials. So for example, if I own a place, and I want to demolish the, the wall, actually there's a cost and the externality is not currently captured in our current system. So if we are able to redesign that agreement, then we will be able to introduce a bit more responsibility into the relationality between ourselves and the environment. Thank you, Fang. Um, Calvin, do you want to jump in? Yeah, and just to touch on, Jonathan, what you were saying about combining the high tech TEK with the high tech, I think um, there are already kind of plenty of emerging kind of propositions about how um, both human and non-human entities can be represented in our governance structures. So um, at, at the current moment, a lot of it is done through human representation of non-humans. So there are um, in, um, initiatives such as the ZOOP, by the Het New Institute in the Netherlands, which is a, a governance model where, um, where there are members on corporate boards very pra- pragmatically that represent ecological interests and wider kind of environmental and social and public interests on boards. Uh, there are also um, concepts such as earth jurisprudence, which is about reinterpreting human laws in the light of um, in the light of kind of ecological considerations as well. But I think I think someone mentioned that we, we kind of skipped quickly through the horizons map. But um, I think it, as we kind of get to the longer, deeper horizons, like f- further on in the future, I think one of the things that could happen is that where we can combine, uh, we can technologically build these feedback loops 
into our systems that allow us to constantly check how our actions are in, 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 uh, um, affecting nature and use that to adjust our own behavior and build a system where these relationships were, are techno technologically represented through digital twins, um, et cetera. And I think with the River Dawn project, we're starting to touch on some of those things where we're potentially putting some sensors and kind of an empathy interface of care uh, with the river so that we can uh, go beyond human representations of non-human entities. Thank you, Calvin. Um, for your information, everyone will be getting to the, the Q&A box very soon. So please, if you have some questions, uh, add them in there. And thanks for everyone who shared where they were from and some reflections in the chat. It's really appreciated. Um, another question I have is about, you know, how do we move maybe from great beautiful exceptions on this to broader, deeper transformation. Uh, you know, some strategies seem to be about, you know, collectivization or partial commoning or about self-sovereignty or uh, rights of nature. There's like all kinds of different ways that are trying to either hack a layer, add a layer, recognize a layer that was already there, but kind of forgotten about. Um, but at, at the core of that, there are a lot of power dynamics, right? Uh, so much money is invested in real estate alone, as you've shown, Neve. Um, and changing any of that is also connected to so much. Um, and so I'm wondering how to, how to ask that one. How, what maybe gives you hope about the possibilities of profound transformation uh, even though there's so much vested interest and money already in keeping things as they are. Yeah, I think it's a really beautiful question, actually. And I, well, I don't know. I get very conflicted about this sometimes because I and I kind of think there's so many problems and we all only have so many hours in the day and we have to earn money and we want to live full lives and live fully. And how can we, what do we do? And what gives me hope is that when I started to tap into, even when I started working on this work myself, when I moved out of my old job and started working on this, you realize there's so many amazing projects happening. There's so many people who are actually starting to find more meaningful work and redesign these systems and root in communities. And there's so much amazing stuff going on. And we don't, and we, and we, there's so much that is out of our control. But I, I see so much hope in grassroots community projects when where people are really committing to a place and maybe they're buying land privately or through crowdfunding or maybe they're not even into land tenure, but they're interested in, in, in growing local food for their communities. And they know enough about it that they can make it into an enterprise and then they're inspiring other people. And it's just people are, are attracted to this because there's some genuine love and authenticity there and they're living good lives and meaningful lives. And I think everyone is searching for that. So a part of me feels like it is inevitable, but we're probably going to go through some crazy, maybe disasters as well that would propel us on, into this. Like it, even for me getting into this work happened during COVID when I was, I was let go from my old job. So I was forced to change. Mm -hmm. So I think, I really don't know, but I think we can all just do the best we can and try and find meaning in the world and, I don't know. We just don't know how it's all going to exactly start to fit together, but we just have to keep going and keep going and do what we can and enjoy life as well. Thank you, Neve. Um, any thoughts on this, Fang or Calvin? Um, yeah, I mean, the, yeah, if I understood the correct question correctly, I think what gives me hope, uh, I guess from, from my perspective, working with the Scottish Land Commission, what gives me hope is that a lot of the ingredients for for, for what, how we make this transition are already existing and already there. And I think the story, the, 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 uh, the, the, the system of crofting, for example, in the, in the highlands and islands of Scotland, which is like a small form of um, small holding agricultural tenure, which is a very kind of weighted balance of both rights and responsibilities to the land itself, to the wider cult, uh, community of rural community and also kind of its obligations is already a very interesting relational mix and it already exists. And the story of how that came to be is quite 
tragic because of the high, it kind of arose out of the Highland clearances, but it also kind of developed into its own very politically active movement, which in turn allowed the legislation to kind of formalize the system. And I think looking at the crafting tenure uh, is, is an incredibly inspiring example where we can, recon we can construct um, a, a new form of stewardship agreement with a, with a home or land or property uh, that, were, that considers a multilateral relationships, not just with you and the landowner or perhaps the house that owns itself, but also with the kind of wider community and the public and also the, the scarce material, the common resources of our earth and also the, the wider kind of eco, eco, ecological systems that that house and land fits in. So I think to, to kind of, yeah, to recap, what gives me hope is that these ingredients are already there and we have to find the right strategic testing points and leverage points to kind of um, to, to, to build on them. Thanks, Calvin. Any thought on this, Fang, before we... Yeah, move? there are, just very quickly, there are cultural institutions and grassroots um, organizations and like local uh, not-for-profit organizations are very interested in demonstrating um, these kind of new realities with us that is beyond extraction and dom domination, OPAs being one of them. And there are also other uh, cultural institutions that are very interested in demonstrating this. So that gives me hope that there are people actually um, wanting to create a space that allows people to have imagination and conversations around those topics. Thank you, Fang. Um, you know, I one thing that can give hope, but is linked to also some, I think, negative trends is, I don't know if it's because a lot of young generations today, for instance, in, in Canada and other places don't even hope to own property anymore because it's so insanely, you know, expensive that there was a research in the Financial Times recently looking at how the voting of millennials uh, is really changing. And unlike any other generations before, as they are in the sense that they're not becoming more conservative with age, uh, but a bit more radical. Um, and of course, there's a lot of trends right now that are really not pointing in the directions that we're hoping for here, right? Uh, a lot of tendencies globally and nationally in different places that are really not pointing in that direction. So it will take a lot of work uh, to shift some of that. Um, thank you all. Um, we'll now start inviting questions from the audience and you can uh, vote for the questions you want the most. Uh, so we'll start with the ones that are at the top um, actually. So first one from Joy Bullivant, uh, hopefully I pronounced that right. Um, Although land may be mainly commercial, but we aren't talking about land owned by local government and national governments such as green spaces and public squares, this, and despite being public, it is not controlled by the public. Does the public need, public does not set the rules of access. How could we change that? Um, yeah, I think that question touches on an incredibly important nuanced difference between state ownership and also common ownership. And, and of course, we understand there's this kind of very tense history over how local authorities use um, bylaws over so-called public spaces um, to, con to control and discriminate who gets to enjoy them. And I think, um, and so a lot of our work in Dark Matter is about, again, kind of uh, building out those common governance uh, structures rather than rather than relying on the the state to kind of steward those um, common resources benevolently and um, to kind of go back to a Scotland example um, one one interesting uh, precedent that I like from Scotland is that um, uh, these crofters often share a piece of common land for grazing their livestock um, between all the individual crofts which is called a common grazings. And a lot of the time, actually that common grazings is owned by a private landlord, but they've managed to over the years negotiate a legislative a legal system where they can actually layer their common governance system on top of privately owned land. So they can form something called a grazing committee, which allows all the individual croft, uh, croft 
tenants around that piece of common land to have a vote and elect committee members and set rules together about how that common resource is distributed. For example, how many, how much peat can they cut from that land? How many animals can they graze each? What kind of joint collective developments can they make? So I think on that point, I think what we need to do is kind of invest in these proofs of possibilities for common governance systems and use those and transition away from a centralized state control. Thank you, Calvin. Um, maybe because there's a few questions, I suggest that maybe we go through a few of them with one person responding to each. Is that okay with you, Fang, Neve, and Calvin? Uh, just because the time is limited, unfortunately. Um, so second question from Ana Gomez. Uh, do you think these agreements will need a starting point where some points are not negotiable, like the use of water or the exploitation of resources? Or the need of or the need of redistribution redistribution sorry my ESL is showing uh, what are what are your perspectives on that yeah maybe I can take this one I think this is a really great question and I think as well we have to kind of we're not maybe going to solve all the problems of waste and material redistribution and housing or water usage in one contract. I think if we're dealing with housing, let's let's start with a really interesting fair contract there that maybe will echo things around wealth inequality. And with, you know, because wealth inequality inequality is really showing up with housing right now. And I think if we can give yeah, people have can can have a, a, an affordable place to live. And that if the rents are starting to reinvest into that local community, it's a really good place to start. And of course, the house is connected to the local water infrastructure and the people living in those homes are going to need jobs and local enterprises. So we have to start somewhere, I think. And I think if we start with housing, I think, and create established communities where people actually have the right to put down roots, I think naturally they're going to want to connect with all of the other um, aspects of this, whether it's local food systems or water systems or sewage systems or local like new enterprises that are ecologically healthy I think that'll start to kind of spin off naturally but I think people having the right to put down roots is really is really core and essential and I think if people don't have the right to put down roots somewhere like generation rent and they don't really feel like they can even belong to anywhere I think this other stuff isn't really going to happen. Like the crofter communities, they, they you know, they obviously belonged to that place. They had an incentive to redesign these contracts that was connected with their enterprises. So I think people need to have incentives if these new solutions are going to be created. And I think having the right to be somewhere and feeling a sense of belonging, mainly through security of tenure and housing contracts, I think is really, really crucial as a place to start. Thank you, Neve. Um I guess maybe a segue to the next question is, you know, yes, the right to be rooted somewhere. And at the same time, so many regions and places will need to have managed retreats because of rising seawater levels, because of climate change, migration, climate migration. And so a lot of places will have no other choice than to completely reinvent how we relate to the land in those places and the people who used to live there. And so there's a lot of shifts happening that are clearly pointing at radical new changes on the horizons. And then on that point, uh, so G, G was asking, how in practice would it be possible to really move away from entrenched and entrenched models like the freehold or leasehold system in this country. Uh, in this country, I'm, I'm assuming it's the UK. Um, anyone would like to? Oh, wait, so I'm sorry, I, my bad. I was thinking that they would show in order of uh, votes, but they don't. So I'm realizing that some have more votes uh, at the bottom. Um, so maybe I'll move to. That's OK. I could just yes. answer to that quickly. But like, I mean, Fairhold is a new form of leasehold um, that Open System Labs are designing that we're looking for a, pri a pilot project at the moment that can be, um, so this new form of ownership can be enacted. All we're looking, all you need is a, is a private landowner um, to agree to it. So Fairhold is one very much realistic working example of that currently. Um, 
and then there's many many examples of community land trusts and all and and, and yeah but Fairhold by Open Systems Lab is is definitely a very great solution to that in the UK context. Thank you and thank you while you were answering I found the new filter to put the ones with the most votes at the top uh so next one by David uh, Butcher by uh the the examples that we've looked at are amazing but generally work within the capitalist political system to move to move beyond these beautiful exceptions do you think it's necessary to have a wider system change or is land system change the starting point wants to go first sorry I'm hugging all these questions I'll jump in quickly and then maybe Calvin if you want to go I think the fascinating thing about land system change is that we we can solve it through contract law so all you need if, if you want to create a new form of ownership you kind of need between 10 and 20 thousand to pay to a, a solicitor or a lawyer to write up that new contract and by creating a new contract you are redesigning the system because it's so systemic relationships to land so that's the amazing thing about redesigning land ownership it is system change and it can be done um you know it can it's it, it can be done at very at a very small scale but it, and and, it, and it's 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 a system change in itself so that's why it's such a fascinating con to contract contract law but yeah we need innovative creative lawyers to get on board with this really <laughs> Yeah, I, I like to echo what Neve was saying. I think a lot of the experiments that we're looking at can be achieved through the context of private contracts and, and experimenting and, and how much in, in, in that within that sandbox. Um, but I can't help but hear a kind of undercurrent of revolution in what in, in kind of David's question about reforming up and uprooting the entire land system. Um, I think um yeah, I think a lot of the, the 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 theory of change that we're kind of proposing is based on an orderly transition rather than a kind of completely uprooting of the land system. Because I think I think if you kind of consider the impacts, I think it's not just as simple as the evil landowner and the the kind of the, the working masses. I think, for example, a lot of our working pensions, for example, are rooted in this kind of co constantly inflating land and property prices. You know, what would be the and, and people's homes and retirements and whatever will all are all rooted in this kind of common but perhaps fatal belief that the land values will keep on rising and rising and i think what the, the questions we have to ask ourselves is um short of overthrowing <laughs> overthrowing the current system we're in uh, with, with with pitchforks and uh torches how can we kind of have an orderly transition without kind of creating unexpected and cascading risks from up, uprooting the entire land system itself so from my personal perspective it's about evolution not revolution thank you calvin and it, it is a tricky one right because the you know we were talking in the intro about moving from systems of domination oppression control oftentimes you know uh there was one question below about you know squatting and trespass often the threat of violence and of policing is what will even keep people from trying to challenge an existing model. And so the role of masses and organizing around even giving any hope for an alternative model to exist is, is a very, really important question. Um, next question by uh, James. Apologies in advance for this naughty question. Uh, do you all see the ever increasing ecological social instability resulting from poly crisis as the main driver of these new ontologies and civiliz civilizational protocols? And if so, how do you account for the likely potential for crisis to drive centralization and executive control as opposed to relational inter interdependencies with land and nature as described this, this evening? Uh, I might want to I, can I can I jump in quickly? I, I know I've been talking a, a lot, um, but I think yeah, that's a very common instinct to kind of respond to urgency and crisis with um, full state plan central planning and control. And I think if you look at the UK's own history, like the aftermath of the Luftwaffe bombing and the Second World War, where where the UK decided to completely reform its land system with the kind of 1947 Town and Country Planning Act, where it nationalized all land development rights because it was so the argument essentially was saying, you know, our country has been destroyed, you know, our, our towns and cities, we need to urgently put a 
a, a slam on the brakes to stop people rebuilding in a negative way. And we need to kind of control the system centrally so we can plan out in a set technically and scientifically efficient manner. And of course, I think uh, I'm almost an, uh, 60 years on, 70 years on from that decision, we are seeing some of the unintended consequences of that result. So I would urge caution to everyone having this kind of uh, 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 kind of knee-jerk reaction to centralize and rely on the benevolent and also a competent uh, decision-making of a centralized state in order to decide how we transition uh, for the climate future. Thank you, Calvin. Any other thoughts on this one? If I may, I would add, you know, there, there's this quote about, you know, when a crisis occurs, there's so much potential to get to the ideas that are already laying around as an alternative. And I thought it was from Milton, Milton Friedman originally, but I learned uh, last week that it was actually from Francis Perkins that saying, uh, I think it's true though that in a moment of crisis, there is an immense opportunity to do things differently and ideally not replicate or go deeper into some existing problematic frameworks, but really change. And how we do that is a very good question because uh, there will be more of that. Um, next question. Um, any comments on actions to move beyond ownership and private ownership models of land as a whole? Uh, for instance, squatting or trespass. We touched a little bit about that earlier, but wondering if there's any other thoughts on this? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Any comments on actions to move beyond ownership, private ownership models of land as a whole, for instance, squatting or trespass? I mean, I know the Right to Roam campaign in the UK are very active and they're trying to change laws of trespass. And they're using a really convincing argument that, you know, I think it's something like 70 or 80 percent of rivers in, in England are under private ownership and people can't even access them. Um, so even with just being able to connect with nature and things like that, it's like there's so much of the English countryside that's in these big privately owned estates and the right to roam campaign. They're doing amazing work. If I was in England, I'd love to speak. They're doing these kind of trespass, mass trespass events that are organized and they're they're trespassing on these country estates and trying to change policy as well with with the laws of trespass which i think is really really fascinating and mm -hmm. um, i would say to check those guys out the right to roam campaign the laws thank of trespass. You. thank you neve um another maybe uh answer or yeah one angle on this uh sheila foster in the us was talking recently about uh I think it's a social function of property and how it's happening in South America as a way to really rethink the right to exclude and really transform that into like something more around the social function of property. Um, I say I'm really curious to see what is going to happen with all the vacant spaces in downtown that have resulted from the pandemic and remote work and you know, it seems like there's some initiatives around transitional use of vacant buildings in some countries. There's some initiatives around turning that into housing, but it seems like there's a huge kind of shared momentum around what will happen with this. And I wonder if there's hope that this will go in a direction that could be quite hopeful. Um, we'll see. Thank you, Sarah, for your question. Um, this one, next one is about uh, from Aiden. Um, I worry about the concept of elective indigeneity, indigeneity. Um, landowners such as our new king claim stewardship over the land they own, but this does not transform their hold on power. And in the UK, the far right claim a version of Aboriginal Britishness in order to exclude people. And this has historically also been a troubling undercurrent in early UK environmental movements, which often had links to eugenics. How can indigeneity escape this problem if applied in the colonial center? Very good question. It's a really interesting question, isn't it? And I think the, it speaks to as well the danger of, of, 
of falling into these like left or right ideologies. And when we really talk about land rights and land ownership, it transcends these old ideologies of left or right. And I mean, if people have fair relationships to the land, if we, for example, if we start about a model around home ownership, whether you're from a left or right political background, you should, you need to have fair rights to the place that you live and fair rents and all of that. So I just think to kind of debate some of these new land ownership models through the lens of like any political ideology I would love to see happen and just to kind of to prove how ineffective they are. We don't need to kind of be bounding ourselves to these political ideologies anymore. It's, it's, it doesn't seem to be so effective, at lo especially, especially when it comes to like, what are the rights you have to the place that you live when it comes to home ownership, home ownership. Yeah. Thank you, Neve. Um, I'd like to quote maybe on this. I, I know it's not about the UK and maybe Calvin, uh, maybe you have some more thoughts on this, but the, you know, there's the land back movement uh, in Canada and other places that is really about taking back some of the land by indigenous nations. And then there's a quote by uh, John Burroughs, who is the created one of the only programs that teaches indigenous law, civil law, common law side by side. Oh, common law and indigenous law side by side, sorry, at the University of Victoria, um, who was asking, will Aboriginal title housed privately held beneficial interest in land or will privately owned land prevent declarations of Aboriginal title over such lands? And so I think this question is still up in the air in so many contexts and it will might look very differently in one context versus another given so many different factors. Um, but yeah, any other thoughts on the this question in the UK context specifically? I don't know about the UK context, but I looked at um, the grant of native title around the Byron Bay area in, in Australia. And, um, you know, this new title meant that uh, the Bundjalung community from that area that proved that they're, they belonged to that area, their rights gave them the right to kind of fish and created employment opportunities. So they're managing national parks and all this kind of thing. But yet, because of private land ownership, that and they can't and the housing cost of housing in these areas it's a very highly sought after place to live they have the people who are working in these national parks the the aboriginal people they have to commute maybe three hours away because of house prices so you know they've proved that they belong to this place for thousands of years but yet they can't get a home there and they're working there mm -hmm. so yeah the native title doesn't address their their life in a holistic way especially around housing because obviously the cost of housing prevails um private land ownership but that that's really how people become eligible for a place you know how much can they afford for a house thank you neve um thank you aiden for this question i think uh, it deserves maybe an entire panel uh maybe for the next festival of debate uh joe uh <laughs> Um, so we just have a few minutes left. I'm wondering, um, maybe we'll, uh, I don't think we have time for another question. Joe, do we have time for another question or should we start closing? I think you can go ahead. I don't need to say anything. You can skip my part at the end. You can maybe take a bit more. Okay. So last question from Julius. Um, I'd be really interested in hearing your thoughts on the connection between property and debt especially in relation to public planning. I feel like this is kind of, should, should, I, should I take this one? Um, yeah, yeah, so maybe maybe on this one, I think my, my actual personal research is about the origins of the UK planning system. And it's actually really interesting if you look back at the original of what uh, committee and how they kind of arrived at the decision where, the, 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 where you have to apply for planning permission uh, to, to, to develop your land. And I think originally, actually, the problem they were trying to solve is the issue of betterment. So, you know, essentially, you know, what happens to unearned land value gain when, uh, uh, when, when a planning authority kind of 
uh, allocates a certain use class or kind of gives permission for the land to be developed. And so the entire enforcement mechanism of the British planning system is actually designed to implement a, a, a land value tax, essentially, which I think I suspect your question is kind of about. So, you know, the idea that, you know, if the state gives you permission, your land rises in value and that value, you didn't do anything to earn. So there's actually a kind of bet betterment kind of tax that um, that is taken away. And sadly, uh, after only a, maybe around nine, eight years of that system being in place, um, uh, it's actually quite interesting. So it was Churchill as a liberal who's uh, in, uh, kind of imposed the kind of people's budget with a uh, in the, with the liberals back in early 1900s, but then it was Churchill himself in the 1950s as a conservative who removed that part of the planning system. So all we're left with is like a centralized system for deciding who has permission and who doesn't. But the actual economic redistribution of the land of the public planning system was completely lost, and attempts to bring it back uh, since have been kind of um, mixed at best. So um, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of my take on your question. Julia. Thank you, Calvin. Um, last one, and we do the ending quite fast. Okay, so another naughty one by James. Um, do you imagine a kind of weaving between different approaches to proper ties that reflects the likely plurality of different approaches to protocols and ontologies in different parts of the world? And how do you imagine that working coherently on a planetary scale? Um, Maybe a quick thought on that, because it's kind of a question that we've asked ourselves recently, right, Calvin and Fang about, you know, are we arguing for a coexistence of a wide plurality of approaches or moving towards something else? And there's tons of examples in history of small changes in one place that have really created something uh, more generalized. Um, any thoughts on, on this, Calvin and Fang, on proper ties? Sorry, I'm just trying to parse the question. So talking about the weaving between different approaches to reflect a plurality of different protocols and ontologies in different parts of the world, uh, and how would that work coherently on a planetary scale? Well, I, I think, I mean, my kind of gut reaction to that question is that these proper ties and this web of relationships doesn't stop at national borders and i think some some things are relationships with the global commons like the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere or the kind of ozone layer for example or you know so so i think the idea the, the, the shift to a web of relationships rather than bounded territorial entities and kind of national based sovereignty is already a recognition that the fact that there is there does need to be a global network of relationships right but um i think the nature of those relationship might vary at a regional and kind of national lower kind of local scale but also there might be there's also like a broader connection and the strength is the, the way that kind of the system might be managed is the way the strength of those interrelationships happen on different geographic scales thank you so much calvin uh, we have one minute less and less than one minute to to close uh so maybe thank you so much for uh, all the presenters, thank you to Fang, thank you to everyone for your great questions, and to Joe for hosting us and Festival of Debates, uh, Opus. Um, you know, I was we were intended to we were intending to finish with a question we were left with, but I think it's clear that there's a lot of questions, and you know, when we start digging into that really deep rabbit hole, as Calvin you described it earlier. You know, we realize how it's about really rethinking what it means to be human and what is our role on this planet that we are clearly having a lot of influence over at this point. Uh, and it is kind of a, yeah, it's it's all, it's all a big question. <laughs> so maybe uh, we'll leave it at that. Uh, and I'll just hand it over to uh, Joe. Uh, again, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and all of our panelists uh, tonight. I thought it was a, a fascinating uh, webinar discussion. I really enjoyed uh, the discussion. And um, for those of you who are based in Sheffield who are watching this, we'll be exploring these issues 
uh, again on Saturday, uh, in specifically in regards to the River Don project at the Kellam Island Industrial Museum in the Brilly Room. Um, so yeah, there are still tickets available for that. It would be lovely to see some of you there. Um, that's it. I uh, hope you enjoy uh, the rest of your evening. Thanks again. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you.